The koshas are the metaphorical layers that comprise the self or soul. The meaning comes from the Upanishads, the ancient Vedic texts that informed Hinduism and many aspects of yoga philosophy. Kosha translates to sheath in Sanskrit. According to ancient Vedantic philosophy, the five sheaths provide a framework for understanding the innermost self, or Atman, which is Sanskrit for the spirit or soul. There are total five layer or koshas. 1. Anamaya kosha or layer, the body of skin, bone and flesh. This is Anamaya. Now, the opening should says, take a close look at this. Are we really this body? Are you really this body? Why not? Well, far, far to begin with. There are so many reasons, one after another powerful reasons, disturbing reasons which show us that why we cannot be the body. First of all, the body changes. So, the same body was the body of a little boy or a girl, then a teenager, then a young man or woman, now a middle-aged man or woman, an old person. So much change in the body from that little guy to this old person. So much change, and yet we feel I am the same person. I was the one who was a little kid. I am the one who's an old man. Once a great Hindu philosopher said, I was a little boy playing on the lap of my grandfather. I'm now sitting with my grandson on my lap, yet I'm the same one. Once an elderly lady was walking past a shopping window and she saw the reflection and she said, the first thought in her mind was who's this old lady? And she realized it's me. And then she think, well, it just seemed as 30 years ago, I was this younger. If you think about it psychologically, what a tremendous change this body is undergoing. I don't think that I was once a little guy and now somebody else, and the middle-aged man was somebody else, and now I'm somebody else. No, I think I'm the same person. If I'm the same person, the body is certainly not the same. Body certainly not the same. Body is changing continuously. How can I be the body? Another thing the body is always an object. Do I know the body? Yes. I'm always aware of the body. I can see the body. I can touch the body internally. I can always feel the body. So all five senses operate on the body very clearly revealed to the five senses. I am the knower of the body. The body is a known object. The knower and the known are two different entities. So the knower is me, obviously. That's what I feel. I never feel the body's knowing me. I look at the hand and I feel I'm looking at my hand. I never get the feeling that the hand is looking back at me. That would be so weird. So you are the seer and the body is the scene. We are not the body. Other examples. Always we think of ourselves as conscious. We never think of ourselves as unconscious and the body is something that we are conscious of. We always regard ourselves as setna or sentient or aware. We are beings of consciousness, beings of awareness. Whatever we think ours about ourselves, we first of all know that we are aware sentient. The body is insentient. It is pervaded by me, which is sentient. See, I pervade the body as a sentient being. So the body is not me. There are many reasons, page after page, and you don't have to come to Vedanta philosophy, every Indian philosophy, all the Buddhist philosophies, all the Jain and Sikh philosophies, all the Indian philosophies will tell you, you are not the body, and they'll give you reasons page after page. 2. Pranamaya kosha or layer, the hunger, the thirst is prana, the experience of health, energy, our experience of sickness, lack of energy. This is due to prana, the body remaining the same. It is the prana that changing throughout our body. Sometimes we are healthy and sometimes sick. It is all due to the prana in the body. From all of this, we can say that I might be life. But then when we look closely, we see that our body is changing as sometimes we're energetic and sometimes we're absolutely dead tired. Sometimes I am healthy, 
Sometimes I feel absolutely sick. It's continuously changing. The power surges in and out of the body, and it's continuously changing. And I am unchanging. I'm the same person who was ill, and the same person who's cured. I'm the same person who was hungry now. I couldn't eat a bite more. I'm the same person. I am not changing. I am the same reason. The prana is known. I am aware of the prana and its activities of the prana all the time. So you are that which is aware of the prana. The prana is the known and we are the knower. The prana is something that is known. Again, you are conscious. The prana is insentient. For all these reasons, you cannot be the prana, you must be something deeper. Think deeply, and you see it becomes an object. Just as this body is an object. The prana is a subtle object, you can't see it, but you can certainly feel it. So it's not you either. 3. Marmaya kosha or layer. What can be subtler and more interior to life processes? It is the mind, our thoughts, our emotions, our memories, indeed our entire personality. That's you, isn't it? And we say, yeah, that's it right now, if I found who I am really. And it is true that most of us educated, grown-up, mature people, we identify ourselves with our personality. Do we know that's who we think they are really speaking? No matter how much Vedanta we read, we mostly we get stuck at the personality. I am my likes and dislikes, my ideas, my thoughts, my memories, my identity, my feelings, my personality, it's who I am. Whenever the ads advertisements, they will say discover who you are. What they mean is your personality. Upanishad says just a minute, not so fast. Are you aware of your mind? Yes. When I'm happy, I know that I'm happy. When I'm unhappy, I know that I'm unhappy. When I have desires, I know that I have desires, of course. Clearly, I cannot be the mind, why not? Many, many reasons. One reason, of course, is the mind is something that is experienced. Just as the body is experienced, the problem is experienced. Our thoughts are also experienced. Our personalities are also experienced by you, not by anybody else. They can see it from outside, see it from our behavior, but we experience our own ideas, thoughts, memories from the inside as it were. We have a privilege of first person point of view. So we experience it. If we experience it, then the mind also becomes knower, an object of knowledge, and I become the knower. The mind becomes something changing, and of course the mind changes. Somebody said we have 16,000 thoughts in our waking day, daytime. Till we go to sleep every day we have 16,000 approximately thoughts, not different thoughts, mostly repetitive and mostly useless, but 16,000 thoughts. If they are not useless, we will be wiser than any Nobel Prize winner. But mostly they are repetitive patterns of thinking, but they are different thoughts, and I am the one to whom these thoughts come. I cannot be all of that. Desires, so many desires. But I'm one. I don't think I'm many. I am one until, unless I have a multiple personality disorder. But I think I'm one person, desires, and many number. I remember the first thing we learned in our economics class. Back in school, the first thing they taught us I still remember human desires are infinite, resources are limited. But the point is, desires are infinite. I don't think I'm many number, I'm just one. So how can I be my desires? They are no, they are there in the mind. They are there in the personality, but I am not that. In fact, it's very interesting that I am not the personality, I'm not the mind either. The very word personality. No, it comes from the original Greek roots. The person wear masks. The word personality means a mask. It's not you. It's the mask. You put on when you face the world. So, I am not the mind either. 4. Vikyan maya kosha or layer. If you're not the mind, 
Then there is something interior to the mind, subtler than the mind. The fourth layer is Vikyanmaya Kosha. Vikyanmaya means the sheath of the intellect. The intellect and the mind are the same thing, but performing different functions. It's the same inner instrument. Vedanta tells us it's the same inner instrument, but we make a distinction based on the function. You see what the Vikyanmaya does is, it understands it's the intellect, and it is also the agent. When I feel I am speaking, it's not the mind. It's a certainty which is there in my mind. Certainty is produced by the sheath of the intellect, the Vikyanmaya. In fact, the best way to think about it is right now. We are all trying to understand this using the Vikyanmaya Kosha. So the intellect by which we are trying to understand what's going on now, hopefully is the Vikyanmaya. When I say I understand what this guy is talking about, I do not understand what this guy is talking about. That's the Vikyanmaya, which understands or does not understand. But, again when we apply the same logic, are we aware of the intellect? Yes, we are. If we say, I don't see what he's talking about. That's the intellect again, so I'm aware of it. I'm aware of my intellect. So, the intellect becomes an object, but more subtle, but still an object. It's an object shining in the light of consciousness. It's an object shining in your light. You cannot be the intellect. Your intellect it functions in your light. But you cannot be the intellect it changes continuously. So many things we understood in school. We may have forgotten so many things we did not understand in school. Now we understand, and so many things remain for us to understand. So the intellect changes continuously, yet I feel as the same kid who didn't know calculus in school, who knew calculus in college, and was again forgotten calculus now. I'm the same person, the intellect has changed. So the intellect is also a changing object, and the unchanging witness of the intellect. From all of these it is clear that the intellect is also object of known and I'm the knower, the seer of the intellect, and so on. Intellect being closest to the Atman. It shines in the light of the Atman and it seems to be very sentient and very conscious, much more conscious than the bodies is the intellect. But still it borrows consciousness from you. Then what can be me? Let's look deeper. 5. Anandamaya Kosha or a layer. When we go to sleep, we forget the word, we forget the body, which is on the bed. So, during sleeping, the bodies are completely unaware of it. And if dreams are not there, it's a dreamless sleep or deep sleep. It is like absolute blankness. There is no intellect there either. There is no feeling of I am sleeping. If you have such a feeling you are not sleeping. So the intellect has shut down and yet something remains behind. After all, what comes up after deep sleep and says I slept peacefully, I did not know anything. This not knowing something's also kind of knowing. So something must be there. If something was not there in deep sleep, what would we have said? I went to sleep and I woke up with a feeling of blankness. Between sleep and woke up, there is something present which illuminate the absence of the intellect in deep sleep. So hence, there is something in deep sleep which we experienced as blankness as deep restfulness. In deep sleep, small amount of bliss present. This bliss arises from the Anandamaya Kosha. This sheaths a bliss which is closest to the Atman or the Brahman. This is what gives us happiness in the waking state. Also, when you something nice happens to us, and say I bite into a chocolate brownie or something, and they get a flash of pleasure, they see it is percolated from that sheet of bliss, which is Anandamaya. But, when we see it closely, it is also an object, as it is also experienced. But the main question is who is the experiencer of that, as you are not the sheet of bliss either. We have talked about five sheets, the food sheet, 
or the Anandamaya, the sheet of life or Pranamaya, the sheet of the mind or Manamaya, the intellect which we are using right now or Vijnanmaya, and the darkness of deep sleep or Anandamaya. But from all the above discussion, we see that we are none of these these, because these are all objects, they come and go, they change. You are aware of them, you are conscious, and they are not conscious, though they are pervaded by our consciousness. But we are not these five sheaths, that thing beyond the five sheaths. Now, from all the knowledge above, we can clearly say that we are not this five sheaths. Then, what am I? But when we are looking answer of this question, Upanishad becomes silent. An immediate reaction is, it's not there. So there is no no self. It's void. It is empty. So what we are searching, they are not there at all. It's like we have peeled the onion and found nothing else inside it. So there is no self. Now at this point, some Indian sage gives five key points to further discussion. He wrote some 700 years ago. One, self is not an object out there. So, let's take an example. Here is my hand. What I see here, the skin, and inside it, the flesh, and the bones, and the blood, this is the Anamaya Kosha. When I lift my hand, the energy which enables me to move my hand is the Pranamaya Kosha. The thought I must lift my hand, that's the Manamaya Kosha. The feeling I am lifting my hand, that knowledge associated with Vikjanmaya Kosha. And if there is any happiness associated with lifting the hand that is percolated down from the Anandamaya Kosha. So these are the five layers of our personality. So let's take a story of ten friends who cross a river, but upon reaching the other side, they begin to worry that one of them may have drowned during the crossing. They count themselves and find only nine, causing them to break down in tears. A wise person passes by and, upon hearing their story, tells them to calm down and trust that the tenth person is there. The friends, still unsure, ask the wise person to show them where the tenth person is. He asks one of them to count, and when they reach nine, he reveals that the person counting is actually the tenth person. The friends are overjoyed, and one of them asks to try it themselves. They count and find all the ten friends, and suddenly they all become illuminated. This story serves as a metaphor for self, is not an object out there. 2. Self is neither known nor unknown, it is the knower. The second point means the field of knowledge is divided into the known and the unknown. The known includes things such as books we have read, people we have met, foods we have eaten, and places we have visited. On the other hand, the unknown includes places we have not visited, books we have not read, theories we do not understand, people we have not met, and experiences we have not had. However, there is more to the field of knowledge than just the known and the unknown. There is also the knower. The knower is the subject, and it is neither known nor unknown. The Atman, which is the self, is not an object of knowledge, but rather the subject. Therefore, the self is apart from all that is known and all that is unknown. It is the knower itself, and it is not an object of knowledge. 3. To know the self, the knower, you don't need to add more consciousness to it. It is like adding more sugar to make sugar sweet. The self is self-revealed in every act of knowledge. This third point explains how we come to know things by adding consciousness to them. He uses the example of adding sugar to water or milk to make it sweet. In the same way, to know anything, we have to add consciousness to it, which means bringing it into relation with our consciousness. Consciousness is self-luminous, meaning it illuminates everything else and reveals itself in the act of illuminating everything else. Therefore, in every act of knowledge, the self, which is consciousness, is revealed. For instance, the eyes are revealed by seeing things, and in the same way, the pure self, which is consciousness, 
is revealed in every act of knowledge. There is no need to add consciousness to it or make it an object of consciousness. It is the subject that illuminates everything else and is revealed in every act of knowledge. 4. Never say that I don't exist because who is saying it? There must be something which is saying it. It is like saying I have no tongue. In the fourth point, it is discussed the shamefulness of denying the existence of the self. She gives the example of someone saying aloud, I don't have a tongue. This statement becomes a lie because the very act of speaking requires the use of a tongue. Similarly, if someone denies the existence of the self, it is a shameful statement because without consciousness, how could one deny something? Shankaracharya emphasizes that, that the denier of the self is, in fact, the self of that very person. The self is necessary for any act of denial and therefore it cannot be denied. 5. If someone argue about they don't exist and want an answer from you, then you need not require to answer as that someone is not exists at all. In this paragraph, the speaker discusses the fifth point made in a debate with a Buddhist nationalist. The point is a technical one, where in a debate, the opponent argues that the self does not exist, and hence, there is no opponent. The speaker humorously points out that if the opponent does not exist, then whom will they reply to? The opponent dissolves himself and vanishes, and the speaker need not reply to that question. However, the speaker notes that the Buddhist nationalist does not actually say that the self does not exist. In fact, the Madaka Buddhism and the Shonavada school of Buddhism have many Vedantic similarities, and what the Buddhist nationalists call Shunya is equivalent to what the speaker calls Punam. Conclusion is the secret of the five sheaths is this consciousness, which is illumining the five sheaths right now. Also, it's not that we have separated a consciousness from the five sheaths. It's not like here are the five sheaths and here is one consciousness. At last, Upanishad tells us that it is this consciousness alone which appears as the five sheaths. Our body, mind, prana, intellect and bliss. They are not objects separate from consciousness. They arise in our consciousness. They have no objective experience apart from consciousness. Thus everything in this universe is consciousness alone. They are arising and dissolving in the consciousness of the Brahman alone. Swami Vivkanan said, If only you would see yourself as you truly are. All of spiritual life is meant to bring us to this understanding in a living reality. Thank for watching. Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below.